Uh, um, so how much is that? Welcome everybody to the podcast editors mastermind. For the podcast editors in the business of podcast editing, I'm Carrie Eric. I am joined today by my wonderful co-hosts, Jennifer Longworth, Brian Ensminger. Oh, where's Daniel? Daniel Avendroth. <laughs> <laughs> and today we have with us, or tonight we have with us, the father of podcast editing, as I like to refer to him, Steve Stewart who happened to put on the Podcast Editors Conference along with Mark Deal. He runs the Podcast Editors Club, and you can find him at stevestewart.me. Welcome, Steve. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, children, for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to take this father moniker and run with it. Yeah, absolutely. So what are we doing here tonight? Because I think we're talking about some really uh, controversial stuff. I think we are. I think that this is going to excite people if they aren't excited already for this live stream. So tonight, we're talking about the language we use to define what we do. So what is a podcast editor? What is a podcast engineer and audio engineer? And what is a podcast producer? And most importantly, we should start off with why does this conversation matter? So Steve, I'm going to let you run with that one. Why does this conversation matter to us as podcast editors? Well, there was a few discussions that came up before, but I think it came to a head uh, right after Podcast Evolutions when there was an announcement that there was a new awards show coming up. And then I was thinking, hey, you know, how do we consider ourselves in this realm of being recognized by the industry? Indie podcast editors mostly, but then, you know, there's industry uh, specialists as well, the people who work with the big teams and things like that. Uh, Chris Curran also talked about it. Tom Kelly did a whole episode of uh, Clean Cut Audio, and and it really start, sparked a lot of discussion and a lot of arguments because we do hear from people that they'll go and they'll they'll be looking you know for a new client, uh, you know, a podcast editor looking for a potential client. The podcaster wants to hire you, and and you say, oh, I'm an editor, and they think that you're going to do all the things, including show notes. But an editor isn't a show notes writer, so there's a definition problem there. It's not just in our own little controlled niche of podcast editing and engineering and producing, but outside in the world, what do people understand a podcast editor is versus a podcast engineer? Is there even a term for that? And I think that's where our, our definitions need to be defined, or at least what I'm hoping tonight is we actually put up the walls to keep people in their lanes so there is no crossover, no confusion. And then we can go in and actually make the final decision, what is a podcast editor? What is a engineer? What is a producer? Those types of things. So why do you think people get confused about this? Because, and what, do, A, what do we all call ourselves? And why do you think there's a confusion? I'm an editor, but I do a little bit of producing as well. Depends on the client, but. Well, I think it's because we're, we're, we're looking at different mediums right now. I mean, we started with radio and then there was television and movies and now there's podcasting. And podcasting is a completely different animal. But if you bring over some of that sound production into our world, then some of those terms have to come along with it as well. The problem is it's different. Podcast editing is different than content editing. It's different than, uh, let me use the example of mixing. In the music world, mixing can mean the guy behind the board who's tweaking the dials and bringing all the instruments in and bringing one up and bringing one down. And they're the ones who are you know, trying to make everything from a complete production sound good. But then when you go to mixing from a, a sound engineer's, you know, the, the post-production side, just coming with the, I don't know what you want to say, you know, the, 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 we'll just say in podcasting, it's mixing all that stuff together in a, a episode. That's a different thing. You know, if you were to bring the tails in, the intro, the outro, and uh, the bumpers and the stingers, that's different. And then the third version of mixing would be, as you can see, I, for people who are watching, I've got tons of records behind me. I used to do hot mixing in the nightclubs. I'd mix records. That's mixing. It's a completely different thing than all the other two. So we bring these terms over from these other realms, and people, that's what they expect. That's what they think, because it's the term they've always known. So we got to redefine it, or we at least have to at least you know put those guardrails on there. 
on the definitions so that we can communicate more clearly to potential clients and the ones who are expecting us to do the work for them. So you call yourself strictly an editor, right? For me, I think that's the safest term. Although when you go into editing now, you got you got two different possible terms there. There's the content editing, which is I'm, I'm making the decisions on what stays as far as the content. Maybe there was a question that just didn't go over very well. Well, maybe there, that needs to be taken out. That's a content editor where the edit, I won't do that for my clients without express, you know, uh, direction from them. I want them to tell me, hey, take that out. Otherwise, I'd be taking something out that they wanted to keep in or maybe a reference later on in the episode. And I'm a half an hour later and I realize, oh, they wanted to keep the dog barking in there. Uh, I clean things up. That's a detailed edit. At least in my mind, I call that detailed editing. It's it's interesting because your perspective on that, some of the things that you would cut out, I think Chris Curran would consider that to be content editing. So when when you say, I, I won't take out anything that's not like, I won't take out a question and an answer. Okay, well, that makes perfect sense. But I, you know, having talked to Chris, I think that his perspective would also be that you know you pull out the obvious ums and the obvious stammers and the obvious repeats, but if they start and stop a couple of times or if they're talking over each other at the same time, but you can't just delete one track, then you just, you leave it at it as is. You don't try and mash things together to make a conversation that didn't happen. And he would consider, I think, some of what you do to be content editing. Where in your mind does that, like, where does that divide fit for you? I should probably start off by saying, I am not qualified to make these decisions. So I want to make sure everybody knows that I'm just putting in my opinion. And I'm just hoping that we all have a, a voice in this discussion that we can all come out and see what the truth is so that we can then decide from the truth and not just our opinions mm-hmm. mixing in there. But if I'm trying to make it, 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 this is my definition of a detailed editor, not a content editor. You say it could be content if I'm taking out. Right. The, the dialogue when they're all talking over each other. Well, if the listener can't hear all four people talking at the same time or two are laughing really loud and two are making, you know, uh, jokes about whatever it was that was just said, and they're both funny as well, then if I do something, I shift things over a little bit so that the listener can actually hear both of those things. Because it's funny how the, the human ear can actually pick up things, even though there's a lot going on at one time. Like yeah. if you're in the middle of a cocktail party, and you're surrounded by people, but you're talking with somebody one-on-one, you can understand what they're saying somehow. I don't know how that works, but it does. Uh, if I can make that happen and remove the obstacles for the listener who's just hearing this and, and they're not able to see our lips move, they're not able to read lips or, or see the facial expressions, all they can do is hear the audio in their car or when they're jogging, whatever, then I feel like that's my job. And I don't feel that's content editing because I'm just making what was already done sound better. Okay. Yeah. Uh- Chris in the comments commented that uh, the content editor is in the realm of content director or producer. Typically what I do is I refer to what I do as technical editing or technical production. So I probably don't edit quite as much as you do in terms of the content decisions, but I do make some, if that makes sense. So I probably bridge the gap as well. I'm interested to, to hear a little bit more about what Carrie and Jennifer are thinking though. So I kind of edit like Steve. But I also make editorial decisions for some clients, and I consider that content editing, but I don't necessarily think, I mean, it's not like major editorial decisions, but it is to make the conversation make more sense or to take out something that doesn't serve the conversation. And that's something that I like to think that I do very well, and I don't consider that necessarily a producer role. Although I realize like editorial decisions at a certain level are more of a producer role. So if I am really defining the conversation or defining the story, I don't think I'm doing that. I think what I'm doing, is, I, I, it's almost like archaeology. So I'm uncovering the layers of dirt to <laughs> get to what's actually the conversation that they're having. So I'm just taking away things that don't matter. And I, you know, that is an editorial decision, I think, but I don't think it is like a huge, like, I don't think that it's a, a you know, reaches that producer level, if that makes sense. Well, we could then jump into what a producer is. We keep saying that word. Well, that's and- true. Yeah. yeah. Now we got to talk about what is a producer? Because a producer could be somebody who actually creates the content, right? They're producing the content. But in the realm of television, 
and movies, a producer really is. And, and even in podcasting, one of my biggest clients is the Stacking Benjamin Show. He's got four, I'm not sure what you want to call them. They're not, they're not interns. They actually do work for him. Um, <laughs> he calls them producers. Just, like associate producers. And I have one client that calls me an associate producer because I do more than just the editing for him. Okay. So now you're saying you do more than editing. So then right. we've got the editing term. Now we move into more than editing, which is including what type of so, job? description duties. So that goes into the the producer role or the associate producer, which I would say there's like the executive producer and the associate producer. And the executive producer, I think in podcasting, really is the owner or major stakeholder in the show. So somebody where all the decisions, like they are the yes or no people, like whatever they say goes. And that's the executive producer. And they aren't just doing the content. They're probably creating the content. They're developing the content. They're researching. They're working with guests. So it's like the person who wears the most hats, but is also in charge would be the ex executive producer. And this is, I'm thinking on an independent scale, because it would be a little bit different if it was like an actual production company, I'm sure, because the ex executive producer would do less for more podcasts. But in an independent sense, I think that an executive producer is usually the podcast host and owner, and they're usually doing all the things that they can and outsourcing things, the more technical aspects like editing. But if you're also outsourcing things like show notes to your podcast editor or some like guest management or social media graphs. So anything that is editing plus to me is like an associate producer. And it could be also just writing the show notes and the graphics, managing the show, uploading the show, working with guests, you know, that almost like VA stuff is also kind of like an associate producer, even if you're not doing any editing. See, I can go with that. And I wonder what the chat room would think about it too, because there's a lot of things you said. I mean, a producer, I think in my, in my mind, and I'm, I'm, I am also bringing a lot of these, these preconceived notions of what a producer is from television and movies and, and everything we know from who is a producer there. What do they think? Cause I think that you're, you're onto something there. A producer is going to have a lot more responsibilities, a lot more hats that they can wear right. than an editor or an engineer or but what are the other terms we're going to be looking at today? Uh, you know, there's technical editor and content editor and detail editor and producer and sound <laughs> no, designer and right. all that stuff. So somebody had asked, what are all the hats that producers wear? So that yeah. would basically anything that needs to be done <laughs> is part of the product. Because producer to me, I'm, I'm really thinking about the whole production podcast from beginning to end. So from developing the show idea to publishing the, or not just publishing the episode, but marketing the episode. So all those steps in between, because we all know it's way more than like editing <laughs> and yeah. post-production. So there's the coming up with the idea. There's researching the idea. There's finding a guest if you're having an interview show, writing out a script, writing out the questions. There's the back and forth with the guests and scheduling the guests, managing the guests, getting all the guests information. So all that guest work. <laughs> and then there's promoting and marketing and creating the graphics and writing the show notes and publishing the episode. And I mean, I could go on. I feel like that's, you know, makes me think, why would anybody do this like as a one man show? <laughs> it sounds like a lot. And so many of us do. Right. Right. And, but you are pr actually physically producing your show. And I think that's what producer means. That's why I like throw everything else into producer because you were, that is part of producing your show. Right. Now, I think it's important to note, though, that a producer doesn't necessarily have to be the person who does all those things. They could be wearing the same right. producer hat, but then outsource that show notes right. writing and, and do all that stuff. And the person who's creating the podcast themselves, I mean, if you're, Basically, if you're a podcaster, you do everything yourself. You wear all the hats. You are right. a producer, but you're also a podcaster. And I would, I would think at that point, you would say, when you're podcasting, where you're actually talking to the mic, recording and creating your content, you're a podcaster. Whereas when you are doing all the other things, you are then the producer of the show. You're actually two different people, although you're doing all the things for the show. Do you guys disagree with any of that? Well, I also wanted to bring up that Mark commented in the Facebook group that on a smaller scale, a producer, he thinks, tends to do all the non-tech stuff. 
And also that the producer is the one who keeps things moving, making sure the host is recording the right stuff, the promos, guest intros, and yes. so forth. And the producer is delegating. And so kind of the one who keeps everything moving. And I come from a radio background where I was a producer of the show and I was booking the guests. I was greeting the guests when they showed up. We were you know, doing the interviews with the guests, making sure the guests had what they need. So that was a different side of the production. But I also feel like post-production is what we call what we do after the show's done. Well, if I'm doing post-production, aren't I a producer? And that's where the word gets confusing. So then you're like, well, I'm a podcast producer because I'm doing the post-production. But wait, I didn't do all these other things. So that's, I think, where it kind of gets confusing in the terminology a little bit. Yeah, and I think that's a, a lot of the value of the discussion we're having right now, I think, is to not so much to say, if you're an editor, you need to consider taking on these other things so you can t call yourself a producer. It's more, I think, about understanding the different roles or the different hats that have to be weared, <laughs> weared, worn. <laughs> wow, it's late. Yeah, understanding the hats that need to be worn so that you can decide which lane you want to play in, right? So if you're a technical editor and you are a rock star at that, and you don't have a mind for content strategy, then you probably don't need to be the content strategist. And if you can't direct an interview to save your life, you probably don't need to be directing interviews. In the chat, Christopher Hudspeth put in quite a number of different roles that we could consider. I don't know that we necessarily want to expand the conversation to include all of those, but that's... I don't have that kind of time. Yeah, yeah it'll be like a 10-hour conversation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but... I mean, so I, I guess the, the comment I would have for those that are listening right now is to consider that list and see where you think you fit in that. And then make sure that you're playing in the lane that you're comfortable in that one. Yeah. I think one of the most important things that we need to consider when we think about language is what does the consumer of what we do think about the language we use? The consumer being the, the client right, or the, the listener? Client, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anybody who's going to pay for our services, how do we communicate what we do to them in a way that makes sense, but also can demonstrate the value that they can understand? So if I uh, tell you I'm an actor, you can pretty much guess my salary range, right? especially, you know, depending on how well-known I am. If I tell you I am a lawyer, you can guess my salary range, right? If I tell you I'm a divorce attorney, you probably know that I make a little bit more than like a legal aid person. So how do we come up with language or define, you know, what we do in a way where the people that are actually buying our services can understand it and understand its value? Well, yeah, That's we, we all have to be talking the same language and we're not all talking the same language sometimes because you'll see in the boards, hey, I'm looking for a podcast producer when they really just mean editor. And sometimes they'll come and go, I'm looking for an editor when they really mean somebody to do everything for me. So that comes back to what Steve mentioned before, why this conversation came up again recently is because what category do we find ourselves if we're giving out awards? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that we've talked some about what we think an editor does, some of the roles that an editor would fill. And I think we've talked some about what we think a, a producer would fill. And I'm, I'm assuming that at some point we'll get to an engineer as mm -hmm. well. Uh, the thing that I'd like to, the people in the chat maybe to think about is, how do we start to have that conversation about the places where things are fuzzy? So while we're talking about that, I'm wondering, can, can we get some con conversation about how we uh, approach the fuzzy parts too? Yeah, and I think those fuzzy parts really tie into how we portray that to, you know, how we educate the potential clients as well. You know, I personally, I have a spiel. I tell people what I do specifically, like in very clear language, and it's probably not going to match what other people say. I tell them I do just putting the show together, which is what I call mixing, and then I do just regular editing. So that's removing the filler words. And then there's content editing where it's, you know, that more ed editorial ear. And I think in doing what I do, there is some overlap, even in that, even ha how I've defined it for myself. So that's the other thing is, is putting those boundaries in there is really difficult in action and in language. 
Well, you mentioned something earlier. I think it was very interesting. You're talking about being an actor and people know when you say you're an actor, though, I mean, Broadway, are we talking movies? We talk about television, totally, you know, totally different things there. And that will determine a different type of salary you were talking about as the example. So when it comes to podcasting, obviously, whenever we're describing what we're doing, if it has to do with the realm of podcasting, I think the word podcast has to come in front of it. Yeah. Because if we say we're a sound engineer, that can mean a lot of different things. But if we say we're a podcast engineer, now we need to get into the word of engineer yeah. here, then we've got a little more of a definition. At least it gets us closer to what we're trying to describe. And I know when you say podcast editor, again, I think that's the safe zone because that would be the, I think the least uh, confusing yeah, fuzzy. Yeah. Fuzzy is the and word. And I yeah. think that's because people have actually gone into a DAW and edited a podcast or thought about editing a podcast. <laughs> and they were deciding on whether or not they wanted to do it themselves. So I think that is the most relatable word to the people who consume our services. Yeah. And editing in the term that I'm trying to use is similar to editing a blog post or editing video because you are cutting and moving and, and maybe cleaning some things up. Of course, then we got to get in the content editing part of the discussion. Well, yeah, because too, that's but, that's where it starts to get fuzzy again. Yeah. Because when you when you start moving things around, then you get into the editorial part of it. Right, right. I, I think that a lot of what people when they think of editing, they probably think of it more in terms of like typesetting or error checking more than it would be, you know, cutting too many spaces and removing that like that kind of thing. I think is what a lot of people mean when they say editing. They don't necessarily mean the kind of detailed work that Steve necessarily does that's that's just my perspective I, I could be completely wrong in fact i'm hoping somebody in the chat will have a different opinion <laughs> <laughs> no i think that's the safe word editor podcast editor is the safe word i mean you are talking about the lower versions of things that we can do because we really do have to get into the discussion of engineer now yeah wait think, to, let's yeah. Right there. because when you're talking about an engineer now there is formal training for that there is formal education for that and I am not going to put myself in that role as a professional. I will be doing some engineering stuff in what I do, but I'm not going to call myself an engineer. Just as what I can pilot an airplane, but I am not a pilot. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, it might crash, but I could actually keep it in the air for a little while at least. And I could say I piloted the aircraft for a little while, but I'm not a pilot. So I can't call myself a sound engineer. I'm just doing some sound engineering stuff. With isotope, whoopee, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, and I, that's a word I stay away from because I, I don't want to mislead people to think that I have been to school for this. And I think that is a very critical thing that podcast editors, so those of us who are self-taught and haven't had the formal training, we need to not use the word necessarily yes. podcast. We, we need to avoid that word, engineer, because yes, we do some of that, but... We don't want to mislead people or make them feel misled that we don't have an engin- a degree right. uh, and then the education that goes behind it. I think there's a corollary or a, a counterpoint to that, though, as well, because I think that there are some as specifically thinking of like mastering engineers who really have an ear for mastering and are just rock stars at that. But they not, might not be the right person to have work on your show if they're not familiar with the standards that have been recommended for podcasting. So the AES and the EBU have standards. I've been talking with a guy a couple of times who works, he edits his entire show, then he sends it off to somebody for the last step of it. And every so often he'll contact me and just say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing this myself. Would you listen to my mix and let me know if I'm doing a great job? And I'll listen to the before and the after. And his is better every time because the, the guy that he's sending it to gets it like three, six loudness units louder than it should be. And it's clipping. Right. Ooh, because yeah. he's oh. used to mastering for louder than Spotify. Right. And I find that audio engineers don't like headroom very much. So they no, none. <laughs> it's like point it's, you know, negative 0.1 DB. But I think that we should maybe clarify for anybody listening or watching who isn't sure exactly what we mean by engineering. So just, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, so somebody take that. because I'm voting for Brian because he's been to podcast engineering school, so he should know these things. Yeah, so in my view, the engineer would be someone who is capable of running the session and capturing a great recording and remotely helping people work through technical issues and then being able to take the pre-production portion. So if I think of 
or not pre-production, but the pre-editing portion. So some of the isotope work that Steve was talking about, where you go through and you make sure that first you're capturing the best possible audio that you can. And then second, that if there are any issues that need to be cleaned up, you're capable of doing that and doing it to a really high and a really consistent level. I kind of, in my mind, I almost liken it to the difference between a, I don't have a good analogy, so I'm going to mix them together. So happy, happy, joy, joy. You've got like a, a shade tree mechanic who is a very good mechanic, but when he gets done, everything is a little bit loosey goosey. It runs nice, but he maybe didn't tighten all of the bolts to the exact specification. He's good at what he does, but I wouldn't call that person an engineer where somebody that actually looks at the spec and make sure, makes sure that everything matches and measures all of this stuff, that's the person I would consider to be operating more like an engineer. What do you guys think? I think that an engineer is somebody who knows more of the, like, knows really well the science of what they're doing, as opposed to maybe mm. an editor who knows a little bit more. I don't want to say a little bit more, but who who's approaching it as more kind of an art, like a crafter. <laughs> It's like the difference between a crafter and an artist, to use a more feminine metaphor. So we can all like go to Michael's and get a paintbrush, but we can't all have our, you know, stuff in a gallery. I don't know if that's a good a good metaphor or not either. But but for me, it's more about the the technical skills and and the the science behind it because there's a lot of science behind audio. There's a lot in math. Somebody who can do the math. I, you know, that's my weak area. But yeah, that's Agreed. that's yeah. my weak area too, because again, that takes a lot more education than just editing. Yes. Engineering takes and and it's funny because I will hear Chris Curran say this, Chris Curran from Podcast Engineering School. And I've heard Tom Kelly say this as well, that they're they've been doing this for years. They've got their education in sound engineering. And they're still learning and they're still tweaking and they still don't like their, they don't think they found the right, if they haven't yeah. found their, the right settings yet, what case is that for us, with, especially <laughs> oh, for those doomed. who are working with more than one client who has more than one voice? I mean, it's never going to, I can never make that happen. Now I do have to strive to make my client's audio sound better. So there is continued education, even for those who obviously if Chris and, and Tom still have to do it, so do we. Uh, I think we do need to work on on making our clients' work sound better, but they got to stop giving us Zoom recordings to to get there. First. Oh, dude! <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm. Yeah, so we're, let's not have that conversation because it's going to make me sad. <laughs> I'll have that on another. Right, whoever's doing notes for yeah. this and write that down. Conversation about why not to Zoom record. Right. Thank you. So yeah. thank you. I do want to point out that I have contractors that work for me who are audio engineers. They are trained audio engineers. However, I did have to train them in t to edit podcasts. So I have found that to be an interesting twist because <laughs> it obviously audio engineers aren't going to school for dialogue editing. I think yes. that is more, that's journalism school essentially, because they know how to do that which blows my mind as well. They've had like one class, but <laughs> on hand, it's usually in Hindenburg. But I do have to teach the audio engineers how to do this for podcasting. Yeah, it's completely different. I mean, think about and sound engineering in my mind usually revolves around music mm -hmm. and that type of sound where, you know, vocal cords, it's one voice, it's one mic. It's, it's not that complex. It's a completely different thing to work on. There's also no hiding the flaws. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So when you have a lot of things going on in a composition, you can hide some flaws, but when it's just two tracks, you're in trouble if, well, if you but, don't know how to fix certain problems. But, but I would also say that as an editor, we can take on a portion of that mixing engineer mindset as well, where you know, part of the, so the mixing engineer, it's not their job to decide what parts come in and go out. And it's not their job to get the final mix to the right loudness target and you know leveled and all of that stuff. Their job is to make sure that all of the instruments fit together well and that you can hear the parts that are important. And that's something that we can do partially by what we cut. So thinking of a content editor or a, or a technical edit, but that's also things that we can do in terms of how we approach equalization and compression. So for example, if we get a Skype call and we know that the call is going to be muddy, 
we can already have in our mind, okay, these are these are the places I'm going to look to make this more intelligible. And we can we can take on that part of that role, even if we're not necessarily the the full on trained Benda audio technical school to do this kind of thing. So I would say that there's actually maybe some more opportunities that we can take advantage of if we're wanting to. I th- I think that what we do, that ninety nine percent of what we do is problem solving. <laughs> At so, least, <laughs> yeah. So whether it's with our clients in in how they're recording, or if it's in actual post production editing, we are solving problems from imperfect audio. That's why the all the broadcasters now and the TV shows streaming from home. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious because they can't figure it out. <laughs> so, so and keep in mind too that, that we are asked to do a lot of that stuff because this is a a we are we're kicking out content on a regular basis, or the podcaster mm-hmm. is. Let's say it's a weekly show. Obviously, they've got to have a, they got to hit publish to hit their deadlines, and we're the people doing that. And of course, everybody else that does that too. But this is something that people are going to listen to once. It's not something somebody's going to go back and listen to over and over again, like a song. So we've got to churn this content out for our clients. And if it's just spoken word, and I say just, and it does demean (laughs) content, I I realize that. But if it's the single, you know, voices in no instruments and combination of, of, you know, complex sounds, then it's easier, I would say, than what you need to learn for engineering, because it is really just one lane. I mean, yes, there's going to be bumpers and stuff that you throw in there, but sure. that's not the important part. The important part is the 60 minute dialogue that has a guy who uh, starts every uh, part of the uh, sentence with the uh, word uh. You edited okay. me last time. Whoever didn't you? edits that, don't take that out. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you understand what I'm saying is, is, it's it's a different world. I, I got to go back to what we started at the beginning is podcasting is a different medium than the rest. So our jobs have to be defined as differently than others. And and going back to what we're probably trying to to define with all this talk today is, you know, what's going to look like on our LinkedIn profile page? I mean, is somebody going to understand what we do without having to read 20 paragraphs of what we do? What Carrie was describing in about 10 sentences. Can we narrow that down to two? And I think that's where we've got to get to as an industry at some point, whether it's indie podcast editors or professional who work for company type podcast editors or engineers or sound designers or whatever. Well, it would be really interesting to be able to talk to somebody who does this uh, on a corporate, you know, for a corporate production company, because I think that ultimately when it comes to like who gets an award for what and and <laughs> what that category that award is in, those are going to be the people who define it because those are the people who have the money to uh, define it. But I would like to see us have some influence over that. So do they call themselves? Because when I look at the job post, I see mostly it says producer. So, so I'm wondering if we can put Steve on the spot and have him plant a stake in the ground so that everybody can agree or disagree with us on the different things that a producer does versus what an editor does versus what an engineer does. Because because our goal here isn't to define the answer, even though we've all got an opinion. Our goal here is to have this conversation so that we can drive, drive the conversation, really. Sure. I'll take the, uh, the fire. (laughs) I'll take the heat. Absolutely. Do you want me to do it right now? I don't know if yeah. I can do it. I need to collect all our thoughts. Okay, so you've got your you got your content editor and your detailed editor. It's all podcast editor related. And I think that you can define the two very easily with those terms. Content editor is going to be somebody who decides what stays in as far as content-wise, a whole section, you know, question, answer, sentence, whatever, maybe rearranging stuff. Uh, where a detailed editor or technical editor is somebody who's actually going in and taking out the obstructions, the things, the, no- the cat meows. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, great timing. Good job, Clark. Where was I- yeah, where was I this? Leave that in, please. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sorry, by the way. Uh, I think we've got those two terms, technical editor or detailed editor versus content editor, but it's a podcast editor realm. When we get into engineering, I don't know if I'm qualified to put the stake in the ground for that, but I do believe that that's going to be somebody who does have some or all the formalized training in I don't know what you work, I don't even know what you call it because I never went to engineering school. I did take Chris Curran's class. I, I think I passed with a D minus, but I took the class. <laughs> but I would not call, call myself as a an, an engineer. Um, I've been called that, but I don't I don't I don't require that. So an engineer, 
I may need your help with this guy's engineer is going to be somebody who I believe would be more. They are the one that uh, conditions the audio. Does that sound about right? Yeah, yeah, that that sounds good. Yeah, I think conditioning the audio is a really good substitution for for sound engineer. But podcast engineer would be more like that, uh, where we have podcast producer now is the person who wears a whole bunch of different hats on the what was it? It was uh, Christopher said non technical. I think it was yeah. non technical stuff. And the producer could actually wear more hats and still be called the producer. But I do like that idea where the podcast producer is scheduling, you know, contacting potential guests, getting them scheduled, uh, organizing the times. You know, that's the producer of the show, making sure that when the host walks in the door, uh, everything's set up and ready to go. And then they can just leave when they're done. And the producer's got everything to work with. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the, the producer's the boss, essentially. Mm -hmm. Like that is the person who's in, who's in charge of everything. And like any boss, any good boss, they realize that while they delegate stuff, if somebody doesn't show up, they have to do it. Okay. So podcast producer equals BOSS. Yes. Okay. Put that I on like a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I think I should. <laughs> you know, something we didn't also discuss here is uh, when we talk about audio drama, stuff like that is sound design. And I think, I don't know if we really need to go into that too much. I think sound design does cross over from the different realms into podcasting because it's going to be, at least from my understanding and the way I perceive a sound designer, it's somebody who's, who's crafting a story with sounds. And it could be, usually it's music or sound effects and things like that. And, and it could get even bigger than that. What do you guys think? I think it's a whole different world. I think that when you get a sound designer, I like that um, because even with a narrative podcast, I had someone approach me about editing a narrative podcast for them. Well, I can do the actual editing of the dialogue and stuff, but when it comes to creating a mood with music and whatever, I'm like, I don't really know how to do that. It's a different skill set even. Yeah. And you think about sound design too. You're also adjusting the pace. Mm -hmm. You want to leave space in there for dramatic effect or, you're, you know, let the music tell you the story a little bit while you're moving to the next segment or the next piece of it. Yeah. Sound design. There's that's a whole. You're right. That's a whole I different think thing. that was sound. I think that was a well-defined. That's a well-defined job because you understand what design is and you know what sound is. And so you put those two together and you have an idea of what these people are doing. Yeah. So I think that people typically understand that. I think with everything else, we're just all like crazy. We're just, <laughs> so we're but, just but all I, making stuff up. <laughs> but I, I think it is a worthwhile conversation because there are probably some people that are calling themselves editors that are being asked to do sound design. So can you mm -hmm. pick some background music? Can you compose a few few seconds here? Can you create a space using reverb and delay that makes it sound like this? Like that's that's sound design. That is not editing. And so... If we're doing that, we just need to be aware that what we're doing is, is that, and then bill appropriately. <laughs> yes. Well, that's the key. Bill appropriately, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> well done. And I think we're taking the SATs now. <laughs> so, well, how much time do we have left? Because about, we're done. About I, 15 minutes. No, we want yeah. Steve to tell us a little bit about his experience in editing our show. Oh, goodness. From last oh, time. yes. <laughs> when, if you want to be a part of the podcast editor mastermind, we ask that you would do some light editing on one of our episodes and then you'll come on and be our guest. And, and I think one of the things we need to make clear, because we maybe didn't in the past, we don't necessarily think that we are so good that we only need light editing. What we're saying is we're not expecting necessarily that you would have to do that unless you really want to. So if there are ums in there, you would have permission to leave them in. Uh, but that that's just in case yeah, you you're don't wondering. have to take out every cat or every flop. <laughs> <laughs> but Steve, t tell us because you sent us a great summary. So tell us what you did, what we did to you. <laughs> <laughs> also, did you like the way I named my file? <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, Carrie said sorry, Steve, or something like that in yeah. the file name. <laughs> yeah, what I uh, I came in the perception of what you just described. You know, just very light production, very light editing would be needed. And I got 9.6 gigabytes of audio in nine files. It was a 90 minute conversation where I thought you guys went for like 60. Uh, and it wasn't like pre-show chit chat. It was, it was pretty much the show. 
I only I, I spent about 30 minutes just cleaning up the individual tracks because we had Carrie's cat like to take uh it wasn't just Carrie, it wasn't just your cat either. Was Somebody was watching like Jimmy Fallon videos in the background <laughs> and just laughing son. at him. <laughs> yeah, he was he was having a good old time. <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't even notice that like during the show. Oh my gosh. No, yeah. I mean I think I think I noticed that at the time being. I tried to mute him whenever I could, but at some point no, I was didn't. just like, I can't yeah. <laughs> All right. I thought, so, okay. So I pressed mute on StreamYard and thought that that was. <laughs> <laughs> when you're recording locally, uh, I should mention everybody recorded locally and sent me their files. That's why I had 9.6 gigabytes of audio, which I ultimately came down to uh, the 90 minutes, came down to 72 minutes and uh, 52 megabyte file. So just in case you're not paying attention, that means that there was 20 minutes of garbage that Steve cut. <laughs> So if you've listened to this, you probably owe Steve a fiver. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will say uh, there were a lot of the stuff I had. Well, OK, we're not going to insult anybody, but there was a lot of ums and ahs taken out. But I also had to do a little bit of that, that content editing, if you want to take it there, because that show had a lot of laughter in it. There was a lot of fun <laughs> going on, you know, contrary to what we've got going on here. It was, it was much more fun. <laughs> I laugh all the time. It's terrible. Yeah, and sometimes it would just come out and everybody laughed at the same time and it went on for too long, so I shortened it up a bit and I don't think anybody really noticed. Uh, there also would be times when, you know, the joke was over, but then, okay, where do we go next? And you had that little bit of a pause we had to get in there. And that helped to, to shorten the file a little bit, but I did spend, you know, quite a bit of time on that because there was five tracks, actually, because you had all four of you plus your guest. Uh, what else is there? It, it took a while. <laughs> But that's what I do. You know, it's funny. I cannot not do a detailed edit. I can't just let it go. I, I have to listen to every single second. Amen. I'm so there with you. Yeah. And my fingers just move. Yeah. If there's an um, my fingers just move. I can't even stop myself from doing it. It's a habit. And, and I, I actually had pointed out after uh, <laughs> the guys alerted me to <laughs> your experience. That perhaps, and that's why I said perhaps we didn't define it well, because what is the, we all know what we do, right, as editors. Now, when somebody says you don't have to do X, Y, or Z, but sometimes you still feel really compelled to do those things. And that was me. Yep. Yeah. And that's what I thought was happening, <laughs> because I was like, was oh me. my gosh, oh my gosh, no, he didn't have to take out all the cats and all the imperfections, because it's, I mean, it's going to be in this one, too, because I can hear my son laughing. Uh, and it's, yeah, I can, it's, too. Yeah, there's not much I can, I can do about that if I want to also be on the internet. <laughs> so, yeah, welcome to quarantine life. Yeah. So, Steve, how, how long did it take you to do all of that? Did you share that with us? All of it, probably, uh, there was the 30 minutes of just cleaning up the single tracks before I actually started editing. I want to say it was about three hours, so I didn't set a timer. Okay. Uh, the joys of working from home and being my own boss is I can get up and walk away and do anything I want when I want. And, you know, I get to have my family home with me the whole time now. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably about three hour, three and a half hours of actual work on it. And then a, a good 10 or 12 days waiting to see if you guys actually would put it out. And you finally did. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Seemed like that, didn't it? We're just it? a little slow on that. Yeah. Well, so we are adjusting to using podcast websites. And I've it, had experience with podcast. I, I loved podcast websites. I haven't used them lately, but they were fantastic. Fantastic service. I don't know what you guys are dealing with now, but I, I loved it back a year and a half ago. We are trying to make it do things that we do in every other post, and I don't think it's necessarily set up that way. Because <laughs> Brian's going to write us a new program. Am I? Yes, that's what we decided oh, in the chat the other day. If I day. was to design my own hosting, yeah, we don't have time to talk about what I would do if I yeah, had no, the we'll skills. Yeah, we'll do that another time, no. too. Write that what, down. One of the things I'm wondering, though, Steve, you've talked a little bit about editing our show. Do you have any feedback for us as hosts for how you would coach us to be better in the future? Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, there's uh -oh. the, a bit, I guess the biggest problems do come, and it's natural, and I don't think you can control it, is when everybody's laughing at the same time. Mm. Because, in a, I mean, fortunately, you guys all recorded locally. Hopefully other people are listening to this when they're thinking about recording with Squadcast or Zoom or Zencast or any of the other ones. And I don't care what service it is. It seems like all of them, when everybody gets really loud at the same time, then somebody's going underwater. Yeah. And you cannot recover that sound. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Descript can if you do that voice uh, mimicking thing. But that's, that's only for the host name. We won't go there either. 
that's really cool stuff coming out in the future, but we'll see what that does. Obviously, breathing heavy in the microphone and things like that. I did hear a lot of breathing, but I was able to silence that stuff out. Is allergies? I don't know if there's really, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's really anything that you could control that much. So I, I, I had no real complaints other than it was 9.6 gigabytes of audio. I couldn't figure that part out. <laughs> Well, we yeah. are saving in WAV files because we know better than to start with MP3s. Yeah. Mine were okay. short, though, because all I did was the intro and outro. So I'm just listening to the rest of the conversation. Well, I can tell you, one of my clients, Stacking Benjamins, they send me at least 90 minutes of audio for three episodes a week. I, I'd never get close to 9.6 gigabytes in a, you know, in a week from them. So it was just, uh, I think, <laughs> I think so the Roadcaster profile yeah. was really big. Yeah. Did, did you get all 14 me, tracks of the Roadcaster? I, you know, it wasn't. I okay. thought it would be because I've, I've had that before where I downloaded a 2.2 gigabyte file from a client and I opened up and there's like one track and 14 blank. And I was like, what's going on there? Uh, he didn't know what he's doing back then. That was, yeah, it was a new toy back then. So people have learned now. But yeah, it was, it was a big adventure. It was worth doing. I obviously knew that you didn't need me to do that much editing. I don't want anybody to think that this is what you're going to get if you do come on the, as a guest on the show. You don't have to do what I did. It's just I can't help it myself. This is what I do for a living, and I just, it's the mode I get into it, and I just do it. And if I'm going to commit to doing an edit, I'm not going to put out something that's sloppy. Nothing with my name goes out that has sloppiness in it or fuzzy. Well, I did listen back, and you did a really good job. Yeah, I was really, and, and actually, you did such a good job that I was listening to the episode, and I forgot everything that I was doing. And only paid attention to the episode. So to me, nice. that that is a well, I'm just like, are we that interesting? Yeah, I remembered that comment and thought, well, it's probably Steve that made us sound smart. Yeah. <laughs> she totally immersed herself into the experience of listening to the podcast and editing Mastermind. I did, and I didn't notice any editing, so I was like, okay. Ta-da. Brilliant. Well, that's right. You're not supposed to know I was ever there. That's the deal. I was going to say, and I think somebody's asking what do I use. I use uh, RX-6. I haven't upgraded to 7 yet just because RX-6 still does everything. I've got the advanced, though, so I've got the top tier. Uh, RX-6 to do all the audio conditioning. And then uh, I still use Audacity to edit just because I'm so proficient with it. Whatever works. Yep. The best DAW is the DAW you know how to use. Before we end tonight, Steve, you had made the suggestion that since the most common question podcast editors ask is where and how do I find clients? Where and how do you find clients, Steve? Well, I'm in a different situation than most because I grew up in a community and the community made me a podcast editor. I wasn't looking to be an editor. I just happened to be in this this realm. It was a there's an annual conference. It's actually the tenth year coming up in October that I was attending since 2012. And I was always talking about podcasting to these people who create content about money, personal finance, and investing. And I was part of them. But I also did a podcast, and it was still kind of new. Growing up in that community, I became known as the expert for podcasting. And then I had somebody actually ask me. Hey, Steve, we just want to hit record. Will you do the rest? So I'm like, sure, but I got to charge you for it. So I got my first client by being part of that community. And then I just exploded into that community as the guy who edits podcasts for personal finance podcasters. So I don't have to look for clients much anymore. I've got this community that I'm already involved with, and they've given me way more credibility than I deserve. And I think a lot of people can kind of take a lesson from that. I know it's a totally different and it's a kind of a unicorn situation. But I do think that there's something to be said about being part of a community. And it's not a podcast community. It's a community of people who are like-minded because there's nothing better than editing shows that you enjoy listening to. Am I right, guys? Because oh, yeah. the stuff that you don't, yeah, you, you hesitate on the ones you hate and you, you drive yourself to go and get the ones you want to do right away. And that's what I get to do. I get to do my peers, my friends, my, you know, my, my friends' podcasts. I get to edit theirs for a living. So it's a little bit different, I think, than most people. They're just putting their stuff out there, trying to find a client, whoever. But if you can be known in a niche, I think you can just really grow something huge out of that, something that's going to be life-changing like it has been for me. I think even just being part of a podcasting community, if you don't have that, because it, either that professional or hobby community, the being, if you're going to be part of a podcast community, be somebody who delivers value consistently. I think that is truly important if you want people to, and not in podcast editing community, communities, mind you, because there's no point in advertising to your competitors, <laughs> but in just general podcasting communities, 
then definitely be somebody, be known for value. Be, you know, and talk to people and, and do your thing. Can I jump in there on the value word? Because I hate that word. I know you hate that word. However, <laughs> I cannot think of a better one. But the, way, the reason I hate it is because people say they're going to deliver value. You can't deliver value. Value is something that somebody gets. You can't force it on somebody. Right. You can offer things right. that could be valuable to somebody. But the value comes in the perception that the person receives, not the one that's giving. So when I say, you know, when we say something like providing value, what does that mean to your clients? For my clients who could hire somebody who's a better editor than me, who's cheaper than me, uh, the reason why they hire me and pay me more than most people is because I deliver value via great customer service. They know that I know the same content that they're talking about. They know I've got their back. They know if there's a problem, they can call me. That's what they're paying for more than he knows how to take out the Amanas. Uh, there's no replacement for good customer service. Let me tell you, I have had, I've had people leave and come back and be like, mm-hmm. you know what? The customer service was that, that personal touch was missing. And that's really what it is. Value. But when I say value, okay. So the best way somebody explained, I guess, networking to me, and that's really what we're talking about, right? Networking and getting, getting to know people and helping them. So networking is really about how can I help you solve your problem, right? When you have one. And that's where the value is. So if you can help somebody solve their problem easily and very nicely, they will remember you. And they will think about you the next time they have a problem that maybe is a little bit more complicated. And this sounds terrible, but that you could, you know, then lead into your editing services. (laughs) And charge accordingly. And charge accordingly, yeah. So that's what I mean. It's just helping people. Be helpful. Be helpful. Be nice. Be friendly. Get to know people. You know, the original question I thought that I wanted you guys to ask at the end of every show, the suggestion that I I have is because that episode, you were talking about how you got your first client. Yeah. I think that should be your question because that really tells you, you can have the story come from there as well. So I'll tell you mine because that very first client that hired me, I, I, I said, well, okay, sure. I'll charge you for it. It's a side hustle. It was just something I'd never charged somebody else to do. Uh, that I would do for them. So I charge them 40 bucks an episode. The episodes were at least 60 to 90 minutes long. And I, I obviously had not been as proficient as I am now, as efficient, as productive as I am now. So it took me way, way long. I probably made $5 an hour. It was ridiculous. And it was all just kind of a learning experience. But now, I mean, I'm charging at least seven times more than that for my new clients. And I still have my first client, by the way. She's still one of my best clients, too. Great. Oh. <laughs> oh. Well, I think it's because so I still have my first client, too. And I am charging him more than when I first started. <laughs> yeah. But, she still gets a yeah. discount because yes. I get credibility from, from being associated with this person. But, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a growing thing. And I'll, uh, another thing I can share, because people like hearing about numbers and stuff. So I, I had quit a day job in 2015. I started editing at the very end of 2015, really didn't start making the money until 2016. Within six months is when I turned that into a full-time job. It just exploded. It was crazy. But that first full year, 2016 was my first full year of editing for money. And it was the only thing I was doing at that time. Uh, I didn't make as much as what I was making in the old day job. Second year, just made about a little bit more than the first full year, still not making more than I did in the old day job. But the third year, third year, I generated over six figures in revenue. Now it's revenue. That's Mm -hmm. not after expenses and stuff, but I finally made more than the old salary job. And then the fourth year, which is 2019, I finally made more than my wife does. (laughs) It's not a competition, but it's always been something I've wanted to to do. I want to be able to say, you know, and she's she's not going to complain. No, no. No, she's not going to complain. She's she's a brilliant person. She's rewarded well know, with the company. I feel like one day we need to meet Mrs. Stewart. Oh, yes. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd love for you all to meet her. Yeah. This, not uh, right now, though. No. <laughs> it's a little yeah. late. We, n- none of us has gotten a haircut except Brian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Aww. So, Steve, what exciting stuff do you, all, do you have to promote to us and to editors and something about some sort of academy, something Ooh. or other? Softball pitch. Thank you. Uh, 
<laughs> Obviously, I run the Podcast Editors Club on Facebook. It's my favorite place in the world. There's over 5,200 members there. They're all podcast editors. We only talk about post-production. We only wear the editor hat in there to ask questions. Then from there, we've also got the Podcast Editors Conference, which we're doing annually. We did the first one in March this last year, ended it right before the quarantine, which was amazing. Uh, Carrie, you were all there. Carrie and Brian and Daniel and Jennifer. You, Jennifer, thank you for your help, by the way. You were all there. It, it went over really well. We're going to do, do it again next year. Stay tuned for that. But we're also going, we, as in me and Mark Deal, he's my business partner in all this, are launching the Podcast Editor Academy, which is going to be a large resource for continued education, training, resources, all kinds of things. We're taking what we're doing in the Podcast Editor Club, we as in the community, taking that one step further and putting it into the academy so we've got a resource that people can go to to learn things, to, to get more experience and take things to a, a more professional level than just a hobby. And that'll be that'll be a podcasteditoracademy.com, by the way. Oh, look, it's at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> and is that something that people can join now? What's the deal with that? Yeah, there's a wait list right now. We're probably going to be launching that mid-May of 2020. But if you go to podcasteditoracademy.com, you'll see an orange button there. Just get your name on the list so we can email you to let you know about more things that are coming up. Right now, Mark and I are doing a live a live event. I don't know what you call it. I'm calling it Behind the Scenes. We're going to get into the Facebook group, the Podcast Editors Club on Facebook, and just do a live stream kind of talking about what we're doing uh, not really necessarily, we might be talking to you, but it's more like he and I are having the conversation about how we're building this thing. So you get a little back door, uh, I'm sorry, back room kind of discussion on on what we're doing. You can hear about how we're building this thing. Awesome. That sounds really interesting. And if people want to learn more about you, Steve, where would they go? Oh, well, they want to learn more about me. Go to the Podcast Editors Club on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see how opinionated I really am about these things. But I do have a website. It's stevestewart.me, stevestewart.me. I couldn't get the .com. The guy there has owned it now for 22 years. Oh, so wow. I don't, I don't think I'm getting it anytime soon. Nope. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, but, but that that's works. Where you, can find, yeah. you can find me. You can find my Audacity Workshop. And then I'm hopefully going to start blogging again. Although I really have an itch to start podcasting again. Uh, but who has the time? Who has the time? Yeah. So... Maybe you can come on as a guest host, Steve. I and, would love well, to. One of us needs to take a break or a nap or <laughs> something <laughs> like that. Carrie falls asleep. Um, so thank you, everybody, so much for hanging in there with us and engaging in this discussion. So you guys want to tell everybody where you can be found? Jennifer goes first. Okay. Hi. Hi. I'm Jennifer Longworth. I've been here with you and I'm from Bourbon Barrel Podcasting in Lexington, Kentucky, bourbonbarrelpodcasting.com. And I'm Brian Ensminger. You can find me at toptieraudio.com. And I'm Carrie Caulfield. Eric, you can find me at yayapodcasting.com. Thanks everybody for- Wait, uh, no, wait, wait. 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 <laughs> it happened again. Oh, oh it did. <laughs> I forgot about Daniel. <laughs> It happens. I'm Daniel Abendroth, and you can find me at rothmedia.audio. And you can find this episode and its show notes at podcasteditormastermind.com. You can also join the Facebook group if you are not in our live stream currently. And that's where you'll find information about how to join the live stream and be part of the conversation. Thank you to everybody who participated, the Chris's, the Mark's. Thank you so much. And we will see you next time on the podcast, Editor's Mastermind. Uh, um, so how much is that? Um, 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 um